Again, welcome to getting started with IU REDCap. And my name is Robert Ping. I will be in chat answering any questions you might have that are non IU REDCap related. <laughs> so if you have uh, questions about logistics or other training happening that Research Technologies provides, I'm happy to help you with that. But I'm gonna turn it over to Catherine Bauer Martinez, who's gonna lead our instruction today. Thanks so much, Catherine. Thank you, Robert. I um, appreciate the introduction and I'll always thank you for all your coordination and your work on putting this together. So um, today is getting started with uh, getting started with IU REDCap. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, and hopefully um, everybody can see my screen. Here it comes. Um, if you can see my screen, uh, put your yes in the chat window. That'd be great and as well as if you can hear me well. Okay, excellent, super, great. Okay, well, thank you um, for joining today. Um, my name is Catherine Bauer-Martinez and I am part of Research Technologies. Um, also uh, work uh, closely with the Indiana CTSI, which sponsors IU REDCap. Uh, Research Technologies Division um, is part of UITS and it's a center in the Pervasive Technology Institute. And today we're really gonna be taking a, um, a look at how to get started with REDCap. If you have experience in REDCap before, some of this may be a refresher. If it's uh, brand new, I hope that what I can do is help move you forward so you can get comfortable uh, with getting started with IU REDCap. So before we begin, um, I know we have a fairly small group today. Uh, if you wanna just put in the chat window where you're calling in from, um, what institution? Are you IU, IU School of Medicine? Purdue, Regenstry, Eskenazi, IU Health. We support all those institutions, so uh, it's helpful to know where you're calling in from today. Or zooming in, I guess is the word. Um, and I'm gonna announce them out loud. So we have the School of Public Health at IU Bloomington. Great, IU School of Medicine, IU uh, Indiana CTSI, IU uh, GI, um, IUPUI Fairbanks School of Public Health. Uh, so yeah, looks like we've got two public healths, one at IUPUI and one at IU School of Bloomington. So glad to see uh, the public health people um, interested in using REDCap. I think it's a great tool. We have a lot of people at both, at both schools, IU and IUPUI, IU Bloomington, IUPUI using REDCap for their uh, projects. So thank you so much. Um, so um, let me go ahead and just uh, start with our first um, slide. And um, because many of you are getting started, we, we really want you to know that this is just the beginning. And of course, every, this will hopefully move you onward. Everybody started somewhere, so no apologies for getting started. I, oftentimes people say, oh, I'm just brand new to this or whatever. Um, we all started somewhere. So I want you to feel comfortable right off the bat with asking questions, and um, stopping me if something's not clear, because this is, uh, we have fortunately a pretty small group and hopefully um, what may not be clear to you is probably not clear to somebody else as well. So thank you for being open to um, answering some of those questions. So to start with, um, REDCap is web-based. So it's not a software that you have to download on your computer. Um, you're not gonna find it in the cloud. You're gonna find it on the web. And um, this is the location of it, redcap.uits.iu.edu. And if you're like me and you're pretty much in every day, I bookmark it, so I have the location. If you don't have um, a bookmark, if you just type in IU Redcap, it'll usually take you there. You can also go to one IU and type in IU Redcap and you will be able to find that information as well. So REDCap stands for Research Electronic Data Capture. It is uh, fundamentally a, a software that is designed for research, but not only is it used for research at IU, and we do not only limit the terms of use. So if you have a quality improvement project, if you have an operations project, if you have a tracking project, those are all use cases that you might find um, for REDCap. So to start off, um, one of the things I tell people is um, REDCap has really grown over the years. It's been around for 15, 16 years now. And um, so this session will not possibly cover every 
scenario, we do offer support outside of our training. We have a, a, a REDCap email queue. We also offer individual consults for teams that may be wanting to look at how to do a project design to best use the features in REDCap. Um, and my goal today is just to basically cover as much as I feel is possible to get you started without overwhelming you. Um, it's always a difficult decision to decide for me what I should keep in and what I should take out. And every presentation, I, I go through that discernment of deciding what is beneficial because really too much information sometimes can be overwhelming. So I hope I'm not um, overwhelming you uh, with too much information and giving you just the right amount so you can feel comfortable with getting started. So any, any questions before we begin? If you're, if you're not in the right place, you thought this was gonna be something else. Um, so any questions? I have one. Yeah, sure. Um, so you said you, you guys offer like individual consults. Yes. Um, where where do we go to set that up? Um, so you can just um, ask for a consult through the REDCap uh, queue, which is redcap.edu.edu, mm -hmm. uh, or you can join mm -hmm. office hours, um, and oh. we can do maybe a 10 or 15 or 20 minute consult during office hours, just drop in any Wednesday. And if that's not enough, um, I'm usually the one doing office hours, I'm happy to set up another time separately. However, if it's a, if it's a group um, and you really want a group training, um, just reach out to me by name and say, I'd like to have Catherine schedule a group training uh, for my team. And we can, you know, there's so many features that a lot of times what I find is it's easier to tailor it to some group. You, you may have no interest in the mobile app, but some other group might have total interest in the mobile app. So if I cover the mobile app and is a generic thing for everybody, that's pretty much not gonna be as useful. So, um, but yeah, just uh, redcap at iu.edu, join office hours or uh, reach out to me through redcap at iu and just say, I'd like to have a training session. So okay. does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay, awesome, great. So um, before REDCap, um, I worked in, in public health and research in New Mexico, and we, uh, we dealt with paper surveys, and we had thousands of them per month. So I just kind of want to remind all of us, you know, REDCap does make our job easier because it's all electronic, and we won't have to be hauling all this paper around. Um, paper's heavy, paper can get lost, paper can get damaged. In our case, we had to take the paper from our building uh, by truck over to a bomb shelter where it went down in the basement and then we shredded it by hand. It was a lot of work, a lot of paper cuts too. Um, but I'm, I'm, um, you know, have moving from that uh, world of paper to the electronic. I, I can't really say there's anything that I would want to go back to in the world of paper. Paper is a great secondary option, but I, I think now with the technology we have, it's better to go with, uh, you know, if you can, electronic. Sometimes you have to use paper, you know, if you're in a situation where you're gathering quick information and you just have them write it down. But um, if you can, um, electronic data capture, which is REDCap at EDC, is, is really, in my opinion, the way to go. So today's agenda, um, it's kind of a long session. Um, so what I try to do is break it up into uh, a few different areas, and we'll follow that with a live demo in REDCap. Um, the questions is at the bottom, but feel free to answer, ask questions. Um, I'll be checking the chat window periodically, uh, make some time, some pauses, and check the chat window to see if anybody has questions. But uh, just like um, anybody can uh, unmute themselves and just speak up and say, hey, I have a question, and I'm, I'm happy to answer it because many times that's the most uh, important time to answer it um, because we're going over that topic. So, so feel free to ask questions throughout the, especially at the demo part. I, I really hope to, to um, allow you and to lead, lead um, how you wanna see the demo. So, all right, great. So let's move to the next part. I'll do a little quick overview. Um, I kind of alluded to this prior, but what is REDCap? REDCap is our acronym. Um, it stands for Research Electronic Data Capture. And here's kind of a more uh, thorough description of what REDCap is. Um, I think two things are key. 
secure and web-based. Um, so web-based meaning anybody anywhere in the world that has um, internet can log in. And if you are with IU RedCap, you can invite your collaborators to be part of your project, no charge. Uh, secure, uh, we do everything we can from the point of technology to make it secure. It's not cloud-based, it's in our installation at IU Bloomington. Um, however, some of the security we know relies with everybody uh, that uses the software. So be mindful of, of security practices and best data manager practices when you're using it. And it can be used to support research, operation support, and quality improvement projects, and really anything that um, you know deals with uh, the university except for clinical uh, data. It's not an EHR, and it can't be used to support student, clinic, uh, student data uh, because we don't have permissions for that either. You can put student data in there as part of a research project, uh, but you can't use it to do student academic records or something like that. So, oops, back, back. So I created this top 10 list because it was asked for, um, and you know, really top 10 is a hard thing to do because there's so many top things but I tried to create a, a kind of a best practices and tips top 10 list. And the background from this is basically questions that have come into the queue and questions um, and concerns that we have seen with REDCap. So this is where that top 10 list comes about. So first top 10 would be no sharing or group accounts in IU REDCap. Everybody can get their own account, including collaborators, and there's no, no charge. However, everybody does have to have an account. Um, one of the questions we get commonly is, well, I have an individual account and my collaborator has an individual account, but we need a group account. Um, you, you can't have a group account, but you can have a group email as a secondary email. And that usually resolves that issue. So no group accounts, but group emails are allowed as a secondary email. So maybe instead of getting responses individually to one of the team members, it goes into a group account and everybody can access that group email account. Um, this is something that, of course, it's probably with any type of uh, database, but I think it's always important to remind everybody, including myself, that we do need to carefully consider the research questions, the workflow, and the end goals of the project prior to designing. So the design is the beginning, but you really want to design it so you know what the end result is going to be as well. And that includes exporting the data while you're in testing mode to see how that exports. Because there are many different ways to export in REDCap and sometimes people get to the end and be like, well, I didn't think it was gonna export like this. Um, I don't like it. Uh, well, we've already gone through and collected all the data. So there, there's some, then they have to work on, on that um, and that can be a challenge. Limit free text fields. Um, so free text fields would be something like a date field um, they could also be, you know, um, uh, it could be a, a field that maybe somebody decides to use like a name, a date, a date of birth. Those are all good examples of free text fields. What would not be a good example of a free text field would be, uh, what state do you live in? Um, why would that not be a good example? Because there's 50 states. So we want to make sure that we know what state they live in, not that they live in IN, which is Indiana or they're living in PA or PO and they forget what the abbreviation is, they spell it different ways. So when we say limit free text fields, just think about the fields that have to be free text. And if they don't have to be free text, then, um, and you can have some predetermined options, uh, use those. It's just also really hard to do data analysis and you end up with a lot of cleaning. So it's just a, a helpful tip. Um, be consistent with numeric codes for all questions. We do have a, uh, a text, um, we do have a field option, um, field type, I'm sorry, that's for yes and no. Um, and the reason is, is this because yes is always presence and no is always absence. So yes is always one and no is always zero. And you don't have to use that field type, but if you decide to use it sometimes and then you decide to do your own sometimes, just make sure that yes always remains one and no always remains zero. And then anything else you wanna put is okay as well. But I think it's important that there's consistency. Standard measures, codes, and variable names. Um, you know, you don't wanna have a variable name that's 50 letters long. 
So there, the maximum I think is 26 and we recommend even shorter than that if you can go. Um, if you're using metric systems, stay with the metric system. If you're using um, certain codes that you've used in other uh, research projects and it's the same, um, you know, you can be consistent with those codes. Um, just again, good data management practice. Data validation. So what is data validation? That would be like, you know, a date field might be MDY or DMY or YMD. Um, and when you're in a project, you want to keep that the same and you want to use that when you can. So a data validation could be like you use a text field and then you determine it's an email. And that helps REDCap know what kind of field you're using and it helps you get better data quality. Use the REDCap identifiers uh, to identify the 18 HIPAA data elements. We have an option in REDCap to, to um, use identifiers. Um, keeping in mind that when REDCap was designed, it was designed for research electronic data capture. So a lot of these things that we're talking about are focused on the research uh, world. Testing project, pretty self-explanatory. And um, moving your project to production. We have two um, modes in REDCap, development, where you do your design and your development, and then production, where you collect your real-time data. It's very important to move it to production so you get those safeguards of the software so you don't accidentally make changes to your data, uh, which impacts um, you know, the quality of the data. You change uh, variable names, you change things, and then when you go to export it, it's just, it doesn't, you'll have to throw out some of those. So very important to move your project to production and it doesn't mean once you move it to production that you can't make changes. You absolutely can make changes. REDCap is flexible like that. It's just those changes have to go through a certain process to safeguard your data. And lastly, um, questions about IU REDCap, you can email redcap at iu.edu. All right, thank you for uh, listening through those, that top 10 list. Um, it's um, a little tedious to go through, but I think important. So just to give you a little background about REDCap started in 2004 by Dr. Paul Harris. Um, and it's a relatively old software, but one of the things it's done is it's kept up with the times. They're constantly doing updates, upgrades, and uh, working hard to meet the needs of the users. So if you are somebody that uses REDCap regularly and has a good idea for improvement, uh, the consortium is open to, to hearing those ideas and you can actually submit those ideas within your REDCap project. So as you can see, um, IU joined in, in 2009. And so now from the point of IU, we support um, IU, Purdue, University of Notre Dame. Uh, we support IU Health, Eskenazi, Regan Streif, all the eight campuses. Uh, majority of people are, are from IU Bloomington and IU PUI and IU School of Medicine, um, but we don't, we don't limit it to those areas. Um, and again, we also, you also can have collaborators that are from outside institutions join your project. A nice visual of uh, where REDCap has really gone. And um, REDCap is a non-commercial product, so it's growing exponentially uh, through its plus 15 years of um, service. And um, many of the countries that you see where it's growing to don't have very good Wi-Fi um, to internet connectivity, um, but REDCap has a really wonderful option for offline, no Wi-Fi connectivity called the mobile app. And that allows people like community health workers to go out in the community and collect data on tablets and then bring it back and sync it uh, to the web-based version of IU REDCap. So these are a few of the key things that we're gonna go over that I felt were important to getting started in IU REDCap. Um, so I'm gonna pause right now and I'm gonna see if anybody has any questions. Uh, one of the, I guess I'll ask a question since nobody has questions for me. Um, if you could put in the chat window, if you've had experience or maybe your level of experience working with REDCap. Um, I usually do a poll with this, but I don't have the poll today. So. Just put in the chat window, no experience, a little experience, a lot of experience, refresher, just to kind of give me an idea of uh, what, is, what is the audience today. Oh, 
Okay, so new user with some experience, little experience, little experience. Some experience. New user, a little experience. Okay. Um, and if you haven't included your information, feel free to put it in there. Thank you. That's super helpful to me. Appreciate that. Um, great. So I think um, I think this will work out fine today uh, with what we're going to go over. Um, for those of you that have just a little experience or some experience, I think uh, you might know a little bit of this, but maybe we can we can continue adding to that uh, learning process. I'm actually going to go ahead and uh, stop my video for a minute and, and continue doing it just because it's easier for me to kind of move around doing that. So, all right. Thank you. So these are the, um, the categories we're going to review. And I, I put surveys last because we're really going to only cover the basics with surveys. Um, I'm going to be offering um, through Rob, Robert Ping um, has set up a workshop next week through the Cube Supercomputer for Everyone series, and that's going to be offered next Thursday. So once you finish this session, if you're interested in joining and learning more about going in depth in surveys, uh, join us next week. Uh, we're going to just do the basics today, but next week it will be all focused on surveys. Okay, and new user. Okay, great, great. Thank you so much. So um, IU REDCap uh, has to, is, is account-based. So the first thing we're gonna look at is getting an account. And um, once you get an account, you have to log in. I know logging in shouldn't be that challenging, but we do get a lot of questions in the queue about it. Today, we'll create a project. We'll look at field types and field labels. Uh, we'll look at data entry. So as many people join existing projects, um, we'll look at user rights, which is basically who's on your project. We'll take a look at the REDCap dashboard, testing, um, and also the survey part. So um, first step is to use IU REDCap for anybody is to get an account. And remember, no group accounts. So you can go right here um, to the REDCap landing page, and right there is a REDCap survey for you to get a REDCap account request form. Accounts are free. And the turnaround is usually one to two business days. And once you have that account, if you're an IU user, um, you can go ahead and use your IU username and uh, passphrase. So not having to worry about another um, use, uh, password to remember. It's all the same as the IU systems. I think we have a couple people, Robert, in the waiting room. I just I just noticed that if you haven't caught them yet. Okay, so just a reminder, first step is to use IU REDCap is to get an account. Um, and this was mostly for a couple people that came in. So get your account right here. And then once you get your account, you validate your account. You can start uh, creating projects in IU REDCap. Everything is project-based in REDCap. So after you get your account, you'll want to log into REDCap. Again, IU, uh, you use the same as your university login. So your username and then your pass, password or passphrase if you're IU. If you're a collaborator, um, then you'll be given a username and you will create your own password. That's the first step. And like most of the systems in IU, um, we also use Duo. Uh, the difference is that we don't, we don't enter we aren't connected with the other university Duo systems. So if you're already in Duo, logged into Duo, you have to reconnect through Duo in, in IU REDCap. Um, for, the, for the IU people, Duo is your option. Uh, for non-IU people, you'll use Google Authenticator or email. So creating a project is um, what, what probably most of you have come with today. So once you get that account, um, once you log in, you can start creating your projects. I think we have a question up here. Okay, thank you, Robert. Uh, Robert just put a, um, a, a URL um, link into the chat window if you're interested in signing up for the surveys that are gonna happen next Thursday, two to four, same time. So creating a project in REDCap is really easy. I know people say, oh my God, I, I, I can't, it's gonna be so easy. And I, and I tell you, it, it, it is really easy. And um, the thing about it is the project creation is easy. 
The work is the design and the development. And so I want to make sure that that's a very clear difference. Creating is just a matter of pushing a couple buttons. Um, but the work of developing and designing it and testing it is where you're going to be spending the bulk of your time. Um, and then, of course, once you get it moved to production, you will continue to move it forward. And that's going to be a lot of time probably with your research or operations or, or uh, quality improvement project. So um, at the top of your red cap, uh, when you log in, you'll see all of these um, tabs, home, my projects, new project, help and FAQ and training videos. I encourage you if you're a, a newbie to uh, red cap, uh, click on all the tabs and kind of learn um, all, the, all the things that are in the tabs. We have a really nice extensive FAQ. We also have some very good training videos. But for today, we're gonna look at the new project. So you'll click on the new project and it'll open up an interface that allows you to put a project title. You put the purpose of the project and then you can put these as optional. Then you go down here and start a project from scratch or begin with a template. Um, there are different ways to create a project. Um, I recommend the template for getting started. So that would be where I would recommend you can go with the blank slate. You can get an XML file from existing project or copy an existing project but that's probably a little bit more advanced. So if you don't have that option, use the template. And as you can see, there's a lot of template options here. Can't really see them well. And then description. So pick the one that you think would be most uh, close to your project. The template is a guide or a framework um, and it's totally flexible. You can change it to fit the needs of your study. So as I mentioned, it takes about a minute to create the project. You'll go into the project tab for creating a new project. You'll put the project title. You'll put the purpose of the project. You'll decide how you want to start the project, and then you'll hit the Create Project button. And once that happens, you have created the project. You will land on the project setup page. Um, as I mentioned, creating the project is really fast. It takes about a minute. But the work is going to be here on the project setup page. And REDCap has set it up so you land on the project setup page because this is where the guide is to help you develop your projects. Um, think of REDCap as a DIY system where it's a do it yourself. We're happy to support you, but it puts um, the, the development and the design of the database in the hands of the people that know their research. It's not off with IT, it's in the hands of people that understand their research. So they try to make it easy enough uh, that you will be able to follow along and do it as a step-by-step -step process. So as you can see, each one of these um, represents a step, um, goes down farther. And when I do the demo, we will take a look at that in more depth. Um, so it starts you right here at project setup. And the main project settings are, do you want to use a survey or longitudinal? And if you decide that you do want these in your project, you just click the button and enable them. So very simple. Um, these question marks that you see to the right are helpers for you to know what this means in the world of REDCap. So maybe a survey, a paper survey is different than um, electronic survey. And this will help you understand if you need to use this feature in the world of REDCap. So, um, so for getting started, I just want to remind you, uh, hopefully this comes up, remember the project setup. Um, the project setup is going to be your guide to developing projects in REDCap. And you can walk through it one step at a time, I'm done, until you get from the start where you're developing the project to the finish where you're moving the project to production. So anywhere you're at in the project, if you get confused, go back to the project setup and start kind of looking there uh, for, for helpers to, to move you forward. So um, in REDCap, uh, we have what we call field types, we have field labels, and we have matrix fields. And those are all very useful for creating content or questions. Um, so when you are in the project setup, you will go to an area called the designer, the online designer, and you will open up the, 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 the template, whatever template it is, and you will see an option with a pencil to open up the question. Each question would have a field type, which would be what type of question, and it would have a field label. It would also need a variable name. 
And this is exactly what you'll see. This is a text box. So first name, first name. Um, this is very concise and a very concise name. I do not recommend checking this little box with this red here, um, auto numbering, because it makes the field names very long. And, uh, and for most people, they find it confusing. Um, so let's walk through a little bit about the field type. We aren't gonna see all the field types, but you would add it up here where it says add field. And then you'll see the field type, you'll see the field label, you'll see the variable label, you'll see the validation if needed. In this case, we do not need a validation. It will be where acquired field or identifiable field and any field notes you'll need, and then you'll save it. If you are doing something like a matrix field, let's say you have different, different field labels, but the same questions. So maybe on a scale of one to seven, or maybe on um, you know, a scale that is like a PHQ-9, a patient health questionnaire nine, you have the same answers, but different questions. This would be a good use case for a matrix field. And when we go into our demo, I will show you how those both look. So hopefully um, you can get a good kind of superficial glance here. And then as we move into the demo, you can see it a little bit more in depth. So these are the two field types, just the plain one field or matrix field. So many people join the world of REDCap through the world of data entry. They join an existing project and their job is to put data into an existing project. So what I wanna to share today is if you've had that experience, we're gonna look at adding and editing records. You've been added to a project, you've never worked in REDCap before and you're told, hey, I need you to add or make edits to these records. So what do you do? Um, so first of all, you have to have an account. Then you have to be added to the project and that, that those are two separate things. The, the account is at the REDCap level uh, of the whole platform. And then the project is at the level of whoever is the PI or whoever is the lead on the project. You're added to that project. And so then once you're added to the project, you have to be given privileges to go ahead and add and edit records. So once you have those privileges, then you would go here to the left and you would look on the left navigation panel and you see something that says add and edit records. This is one way to go in. It's not the only way, but this is one way to go about it. So you add edit records there. It opens this up and you can either add a new or existing study ID, or you can select if there are um, existing study IDs. Um, sometimes you will see the option to just click add a new record, and that means auto numbering has been uh, enabled in the project. In this case, auto numbering has not been enabled, so you are adding your um, own record IDs depending on the needs of the study. So when you click add edit records, something like this shows up. This is the name of the form. And this is um, either add a new record or select existing one. Sorry, make sure I got that right. Okay, we'll move to the next one. And then once you go to the basic demography form and you're going to see that um, there is a gray uh, circle. The gray circle is no data. So you would click on that gray circle and then this form would open up the basic demography form and you would start entering the data. So as you can see, there's um, some free text fields here. This is a free text field with a validation of YMD because we can see the validation off to the right. This is first name and last name. These are also free text fields with no validation. Um, we also have the option with a date to put the word today here because maybe it's easier for somebody to just click the date that they are using um, their entering data than have to enter the date manually. So when you are the person that's um, entering data, you um, oftentimes have to follow along with whatever is set up for you. If you have the role of being the person that's designing it, remember that person that's entering data and try to make it easy for them to do the right thing. Give them um, notes if possible, uh, sh make sure that they know how to enter the right kind of data and uh, make it very clear. Um, I know sometimes a lot of people do data entry and um, it is a job that's a lot of times passed to students who move on, but even more reason to make sure that you give a lot of guidance because data entry 
is really important. The data is the lifeblood of the project. And if you don't get the data right, it's gonna impact the science down the line. So um, there are a lot of uh, nice features in REDCap to be able to add um, helpers so people know how to do the data entry right. And that might be you know, telling them you want to have parameters. Let's say if you have a cholesterol, you wanna have the parameters be between 100 and 300. And if it's over that, you want to have somebody put a little note in there. And you can do that. So any questions so far? We're, we're moving through some of the high uh, level topics here that you might need to know if you're getting started with REDCap. After this, we're gonna look at a demo. So I'm gonna stop and pause for uh, a little bit and see if anybody wants to speak up, has questions about what we've talked about or wants to put a question in the chat window. Okay, hopefully everybody's still awake. I haven't put you to sleep yet. Um, oh, maybe we do have a question, let's see. Okay, everything sounds good so far, excellent. Okay, so this is um, the left navigation panel. I mean, that's what I call it. And these are a lot of the features that we have in REDCap. Um, so you, you may or may not see these features in your project. And the reason that you may not see some of these features is based on your user rights. So user rights tells you who is on the project and what rights do they have or do they need. So if you don't see some of these in a project that you're joining, it's likely that you haven't been given those rights. If you are the person who's the owner of the project, you can give yourself those rights. Um, if you are not the owner of the project, then you would have to request those rights from the person that's the owner. And that's one of the great things about REDCap is you can have somebody that's just a data entry role and you can give them rights just so they do data entry. And they only need to do this small part of the project, important part, but small part. And um, then they won't have to mess with other parts and potentially um, cause issues in the project. So really important are user rights because they allow you to determine how you want the project to, um, who, how you want the project to work and who do you want to be on the project and what roles that they need on the project. And one of the things that we notice quite frequently is people use emails when they put in the user rights. REDCap does not recognize emails. As, you, as, you, as I mentioned earlier, we support IU Health, Eskenazi, Regan Street. Um, we support a lot, of, uh, a lot of institutions. So we're not gonna recognize an email. Um, you need to use your username. That's how it's recognized. User rights are in two places. You'll see a tab for user rights. You'll also see user rights, hopefully, off to the left on the left navigation panel. So REDCap has um, dashboards. And we also have the option to create custom dashboards using logic. So you could look at people that have a BMI of over 30 that are over 65 years of age. That could be an example of a custom dashboard. Um, in a dashboard, they'll tell that this gives you a quick glance. If you look at the legend below, you can see what's going on with this study. Uh, looks like they've got four people enrolled and they've all completed their enrollment and some of them have started with visit one. Um, one of them has completed visit two and one of them has completed visit three. The gray is no data. The yellow, for whatever reason, is unverified, and the red is incomplete. And this is a project without surveys, so there's no survey uh, icons in here as well. And so you can kind of get a quick glance at what's going on in your project by taking a look at the dashboard. And the dashboard, if you're using, um, would be off to the left, uh, left navigation, I'm sorry, it's, it actually should be record status dashboard, the, the circle is a little too high. I must have moved this and it got moved up. So look for record status dashboard. Um, as I mentioned, REDCap has two modes, development where you do all your design and your development, and then uh, production where you are gonna be collecting real-time data. We recommend you use the add edit feature to add at least three records 
do a test in development. So if you go back to my dashboard, you can see that I can even add new records from the dashboard, but I'd wanna walk through this entire process to make sure that it's working as I expect. Now, I may have another colleague also look through it, but I would recommend at least three records just to make sure that you're checking for typos, you're checking for workflow, you're checking for content um, to be able to uh, um, make sure that your project is ready to move to production. And once it moves to production, um, the safeguards are in place to protect your data. However, you can still make changes. It's just that you just don't wanna revamp the entire database. I would recommend doing as much as you can in development and then making those small changes when you move it to production if needed. And when you make changes in production, you will have to go through a draft process. Again, these are part of the safeguards that are in REDCap to protect your data. Uh, okay, move it back here, all right. So today we're gonna look um, at a brief look at online surveys. Um, as I mentioned, we're gonna have a, a more in-depth workshop next Thursday. So please join that workshop and learn a little bit more about how you can use surveys in REDCap. Surveys are a wonderful thing and they're very complex and, and interesting. And there's a lot of wonderful things you can do with it, um, but it's hard to cover that with this session. And even next week, um, probably won't cover every single thing about uh, surveys, but I will definitely go more in depth than we'll go today. So um, thinking of surveys, um, we, we talk about it being a two-step process. And um, first step is you want to enable surveys at the level of the project. And the second step is you want to decide what instruments are going to be surveys. So the process of designing a project as a data entry, uh, as a data um, collection or a survey is exactly the same. The, it'll be exactly the same. The difference is once you start to develop the surveys, you're gonna have more functionality and more features to um, get into. So if you're working on a project that's not gonna be using surveys, you probably can move through it a lot quicker. If you're working on a project that's gonna require surveys, you're gonna to have to create the regular project and then enable those surveys and start answering the extra questions that have to do with the surveys. So let's say you have a project and you have five instruments and it's a, it's a project with five instruments and two of those instruments are gonna be surveys. So first enable surveys at the project level through the project setup at the very top, you'll see that. And then go to those instruments and enable at the instrument level. And you'll have more functionality where you will um, uh, determine how you want these instruments sent out, when do you want them sent out, who you're going to send them to, lots of questions about surveys, of course. But just to remind people, we get this a lot with our queue, it's a two-step process. So um, the two-step process starts at the very top here. The first step is um, you go, uh, uh, you enable it at the level of your main project settings. So I want to use surveys in this project. And once I do that, I get, um, at the, I get the survey distribution tools. If you do not see this survey distribution tools at the left side, it means you have not enabled it here. And again, this is just a button. All you do is click this button and this uh, functionality shows up. So very easy to enable it. And then after you do that at the project uh, level, you'll decide which surveys um, you want to enable. Um, and right here, you can see this survey, this survey, and this survey have all been enabled as surveys. And this is the extra functionality that you get. Um, if you look at the bottom one, you see this has not been enabled, in, enabled as a survey, and we do not have any extra functionality. So survey settings is, a, is an added thing that you need to look over and you need to review. Uh, once you're doing any kind of surveys and automated invitations is optional if you want to automate the process of sending out invitations. Um, this requires a little bit more logic and maybe a little bit more advanced features, but it's super useful um, if you decide to use it. And as you can see here, um, again, with the surveys, you get survey options up here too. So survey queue, survey login, survey notifications, um, so as you can see, that's why surveys aren't something that we can just be like, oh, one size fits all. There's 
many, many ways to use surveys, and it really depends on the needs of your project. What I try to help you do in the survey workshop is learn about the features, and then you can decide what features would be most beneficial uh, for your research uh, project. So survey design, um, it's important to think about your target audience. Um, because um, if you're going to be uh, going to children, you might want to design the survey differently than if you're doing adults or um, uh, or different different groups of people. So these are just some some considerations that um, pretty basic to go through. If you're going to be making an anonymous survey, we have one option for anonymous. So a lot of times I get people saying, well, I want to do anonymous and confidential survey, and I want to put the email in red cap. Uh, you can't put the email in red cap and make it anonymous. It can be confidential, but as soon as you include that email, uh, unfortunately, you lose that that that, that, that the anonymous option. Um, but we do have an option for anonymous. So um, I want to, everybody to know there is an option for anonymous. Um, the downside of having the anonymous option is you just don't have as much control over it. So it's a little bit of a pro and con. If you have anonymous, somebody could take the survey multiple times and, and you have no way to control that as well. And we have options for confidential as well. So think about your audience and think about the considerations of uh, what kind of um, project you're doing. Um, again, one size does not fit all. So when people say, I want to make a survey in REDCap, um, there's a lot of questions and considerations to take into account um, to be able to use the features that REDCap offers. So this is our anonymous option. It's called our public survey link. And if you look um, off to the left, you'll see the survey distribution tools. That means I've enabled surveys in my project. And then at the top is, oops, that go too far. You'll see the top a tab is the public survey link. And this is the public survey link. Everybody gets the same link. It's easy, it's anonymous, and it's sent out through Outlook. So right below link actions, you'll see send me URL via email. You'll send that URL via email. It'll arrive in your email box and you'll send it out uh, to the participants. It makes it anonymous because there's a break between REDCap and the data. So you send it out to 100 people and 50 people respond. You will not know which 50 people have responded to the survey unless you have included some data. If you have included no personal data, then it will just be 50 responses to your survey. Um, so this is um, this is our option for anonymous, and it has the least amount of control, uh, but it is the most. Um, it's the easiest. Um, however, easy may not be right for you. <laughs> so I always want to make sure people know that. There, there's a definite downside to using this. It, it's easy to set up and it's quick. However, many people can take that survey and you will not know that. Um, and it can be shared and it also has the issue with bots. So that's why right below it, uh, I did not check it, but I would encourage everybody to check this public survey using the Google Rep Captcha. Because as soon as we put it out there, uh, people can take the survey, anybody can take the survey. And um, obviously that they may not be what you want for your project. So if you're looking for something a little bit more um, where you have a little bit more control and maybe it's confidential, but it's not anonymous, um, we have the option for the participant list, which is just right next to the public survey link. So again, the same, um, you'll see the participant list um, allows you to add participants emails to the project. They don't have to be data points, though. They can just be added here. And then you go to compose survey invitations and send those out. You can put the emails in REDCap, and you have more features and more control. And this is what an invitation would look like um, if you're sending it out to people. So you would get the email of the person here. Again, it would not have to be a data point, but you would know that this person has taken the survey, but their data would be not connected to their email. So you would know they've taken the survey, but you would have no way to connect up their data to their email. Um, you can send the survey invitation, you can set timing, you can set reminders, compose message. This is a great way to track people if you're allowed to use emails 
um, in the project. Any questions so far about a little bit, our, our little dive into surveys in REDCap? And we'll look at this when we get to the point of the demo shortly. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and move on, but feel free uh, to ask questions through the chat window or you can unmute yourself. Um, I wanna make sure that I'm covering this and making sure it's clear for people that are just starting out with REDCap. Oh, the bottom there is the send invitation. So basically you'd go through this whole process. Again, it's a step-by-step -step process. And then at the bottom would be send invitations. So for example, I could decide I've completed all this work on Friday, but I don't want it to be sent out till Tuesday of next week. So um, that could be uh, a possibility of, of doing that. You send it out when it's the best time to reach the people. Um, Normally I put this at the end, but I found that um, the resources, leaving them to the end, um, sometimes we don't get to them. So I wanna make sure that you're aware that we do have some resources and um, Rob, uh, Robert Taylor or Robert Ping has put some in the chat window as well. Like for example, next week's workshop. Um, and we also have some links to different um, previous workshops that we've held or trainings or videos. So um, for any kind of support questions, Redcap at IU is our email to send questions to. Um, the landing page, which I showed you at the beginning, is right here. Zoom um, office hours, virtual, anybody can drop in, no registration needed. But if we have a lot of people, you may only get 10 or 15 minutes uh, per question, but we're happy to help you. And if you need more time later, uh, we'll work on that as well. Uh, we will not be having um, uh, the, the 23rd, I believe, the Wednesday right before Thanksgiving, we do not have office hours, but pretty much every other Wednesday we have them throughout the year. Um, IUKB, we have some um, articles in there, uh, CTSI website, uh, training videos, and you know what, I think I have forgotten to put the other ones, I, this is an older uh, resource copy. Um, so if Robert, um, if you have some um, access to some of the training videos, maybe you could send that through the chat window. Um, that would be helpful. So um, we're going to go ahead and do a live demo. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Great, thank you. Uh, we're going to go ahead and do a live demo, and um, I hope that um, this is useful for you to see how REDCap works and how you can get started with it. I encourage you during the demo to ask questions. Um, so. I'm going to go ahead and we're going to start the demo, but before I do, um, we're going to take a five minute break. This is a long session and um, I think it's a good idea to just kind of get up and move around, but I hope you will stay with me and come back in about five minutes. So we're going to um, re reconnect um, about three o'clock. So right at three o'clock, uh, we'll start the demo. So thank you very much and um, we'll see you just in a few minutes. All tracks, what would be the advantages of using REDCap? So um, I guess, are you familiar with Qualtrics? If you've, you've used Qualtrics, maybe um, you know you know some of the things. I've used Qualtrics, but not extensively. I can give you some of the advantages and disadvantages that I know. Um, but I guess, first of all, are, are you already using Qualtrics for surveys? Yes, okay. So um, one of the things I would say is Qualtrics is not for research. Uh, Qualtrics is more of a project, is a setup more for surveys. So if you're gonna do surveys, REDCap offers surveys, Qualtrics offers surveys. Um, Qualtrics is a commercial project. So I believe everything is out in the cloud. And so that's probably handled at the level of UITS with IU but we don't have any of our, of our data in the cloud. And I do believe that the IRB recommends if you're going to be doing research that you use surveys, that you use a red cap, just because the features are set up for research. Um, if you're doing something that's a uh, evaluation survey, then Qualtrics probably would work just as well as red cap. Um, but I would say for research, uh, red cap is probably gonna be the best bet um, if you've used Qualtrics, you may notice that they have more field types, I believe. They also probably have a little bit more fancier interface. And um, 
Part of that is just because it is a commercial product. Uh, we are we are not a commercial product. It was uh, developed out of uh, Vanderbilt and it's supported by the NIH. So they do feel very strongly about keeping this running um, and it's offered free to any institution. Uh, Qualtrics, there's a charge for licensing. Um, but however, I think Qualtrics is great for, uh, for certain types of surveys. I would just say with um, the option of uh, research, uh, I think REDCOP is a better bet. Um, we, we know exactly how we manage the data and um, it doesn't go out in the cloud, it doesn't go somewhere else. So that would be my, my take on the Qualtrics versus REDCAP uh, debate. Um, and REDCAP also offers more at the level of combining projects that are data capture with, with um, surveys. While I believe Qualtrics is pretty, much, is pretty much only surveys. But you can correct me if I'm wrong about that. <laughs> okay. All right, well, thank, thank you for that question. So um, hey, we're gonna Catherine, jump. Um, yeah. uh, I, I just did a quick Google search, red cap versus Qualtrics. And there's, if, if folks wanna do that, there's lots of different um, input from many different places. The Ohio State University has a, has a pretty good one. Um, so yeah, it, Google searches sometimes can be helpful with questions like that. So I'll just, I'll just put what the Ohio State University said, but I think, yeah, in general, exactly thank what you. Catherine said. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, appreciate that. Um, yeah, I um, Google, we all can use Google um, and sometimes you'll find um, information that some other institutions have shared and put together. Um, but yeah, Qualtrics, it's, it's a, often a common question. I know IU Bloomington is, is really uh, more, uh, they use Qualtrics a whole lot more than some of the other campuses. And so um, they're really used to using the Qualtrics and maybe you know when you're comfortable with something, I, I can totally understand. Um, but I will say that, you know, REDCap is research at electronic data capture. So for research projects, I think um, this would be the platform that you'd want to consider. And you can do surveys. And really, as you'll find out, it's it's not a super difficult platform to use. And a lot of people find when they start using it that they really like it. Um, not saying that Qualtrics is not easy, is not difficult either. There's there's a there's a learning curve on that as well. But and it's a very nice program as well. Uh, but I don't think it's uh, focused on the research and the PHI and all those things I think are kind of important to consider. Um, so um, this project is just a basic practice, longitudinal data practice. So I just wanted to show you what a project would look like while it's in the state of design and development. So this is development right there. Um, this was not one I developed, I developed from scratch, but we're gonna go in and I'll show you how to create a project from scratch. But what I wanted to do is also show you a project that is in the state of development. So when I go to project setup, remember I said, don't forget project setup, um, because really this is going to help you guide you through this process. So this project uses surveys. So you'll see survey distribution tools here. This project uses longitudinal data collection with defined events. And that adds uh, another um, step right here. And if you have questions about these, use these little question marks. And I completed that, I'm done. And then I moved to design my data collection instruments and enable my surveys. So remember the two-step process, first at the project level, and then at the level of the surveys. So in this particular one, I haven't enabled any of surveys, but they all have the possibility of being enabled as surveys. So I didn't enable them as surveys because I wanna show you first how it looks without the surveys. We'll walk back over to this. Um, so there are six instruments that make up this project. And if I click on the instrument, um, which would be the same as your template, you'll start to see um, how the design is set up. So remember add fields, add matrix fields. Um, this is a new, this is not really an add field. This is a, a new option from the field bank. And I'm not gonna review that today, but feel free to click on it. It, it adds a little different complexity. And I feel, figure for the starters, let's just stick with these two. But basically your add field option will open up that field type. And if you're familiar with Qualtrics, you'll, you'll see some of the same field types. I believe Qualtrics has more. Um, you could choose your field type, uh, multiple choice, whatever you want. And you know, you know, you'll just put this in here. You choose the raw data values that you want and the labels that you want. Um, when you're doing something like this, I could put 10 yellow, 20 red, 30. It doesn't really matter. The order doesn't matter either. 
Um, but raw data is what you're going to be using to do your analysis. So um, you want to make sure that you know you don't you, you make it make it make sense for you. Um, at this point, I could say this is a required field. It could be an identifiable field. I could decide how I want my alignment. I could put field notes in here. Um, and these are a few other options that we'll probably, if we have time, we'll go to, but I'm not sure if we will. So then I would save it. And again, this is my development. Um, and then I would look at, okay, I've got these three options for drop down. So this is um, when you're looking at a template that you've created, you'll see how the questions are and you'll be working through these all happening from the project setup number two. So second step, um, add or edit fields in your data collection, surveys and forms. This may be done by either using the online designer, which is right here, or uploading the data dictionary. I would not recommend the data dictionary for people just getting started. It's a great option and it's fast, but there's a little bit more trickiness to it. Uh, and it is offline data capture. So once you're comfortable with this, feel free to jump into this and it will make more sense. Um, we also have a lot of different variables you can use and they're nice colored fields. So feel free to click on those and learn more about how to use those in designing. So if I'm done with my designing, I hit the click I'm done, I move to my next thing. This is longitudinal, so I have different events. So my first event is enrollment, then I have visit one, visit two, visit three, and my final visit. And each one of these has a unique event name. I can determine what instruments I want to find for my events. So for example, in this, in this use case, I have visit lab data, patient morale questionnaire, visit blood work, and those are exactly the same for all my visits. So I don't need to create these more than once. I create them once, and then I just designate them to different visits. And that's what makes this a longitudinal design. So going back to my project setup again, um, I've looked at defining my events, I've designated my instruments, and I hit my done. I think we've got a question here. Okay, so yeah, thank you, Robert, uh, for putting that in there um, about Qualtrics. Um, always a great question, and I know we have a lot of softwares that are some overlap, so I think it's important to kind of know which one works best for, for your needs, but thank you for um, that question. So We've moved through three of the eight steps and we're moving all the way through our project. This again is a project that has already been created and we're walking through the steps to do this. So then we come to this enable optional modules and customizations. There's a lot of features here and a lot of them may not make sense to you. So I would encourage you to go and look at tell me more, tell me more, tell me more, tell me more. Some of them, I mean, are you going to use randomization? That would make sense. Are you going to do scheduling? That may make sense. These particular ones you won't see because they are only by request only. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and not do anything with these up at the top, one, two, three, four, five, but I'm gonna pop into additional customizations and I'm going to see the set of custom record label option. And I'm going to put the last name because it's easier for me to follow in the dashboard if I have the last name. So this is not gonna be uh, exported when you have data, but it's more for people that are working in the project. So I wanna know the last name. Um, there are a lot of other features and customizations you can use here, um, including missing data codes. Um, not going to get into all of these today, but do feel free to look at them when you are developing your project. And they will be in optional modules and customizations. So moving to the next step, all the way down there. And then if I want to set a project bookmark, that could be optional. Maybe I'm linking two projects together. Maybe I have a NIH website that I like to use while I'm in this project. That could be an optional thing here. I'm not going to do that today, but there we are. So then we go to the user rights and per permissions. I think this was a part of the project that we talked about who's on your project and what rights and permissions do they have. So let's open up user rights and let's take a look. So there my name is on the project because I'm the person that uh, I developed the project. I have user rights within the user rights. So that's why I see all these applications. Um, there's another person on the project who is not actually existing because their name is not in parentheses. So I'm going to go in there and take a look at their privileges. So they have design privileges. They're also considered an owner. 
Uh, they have a lot of privileges on this project. So these are all the different privileges that I could give them. And within each instrument, um, I could allow them to have no access or read-only access. And why would you do that? Again, this is kind of based on the world of research. Perhaps you have PHI in the project and you do not want all the people on the project to be able to see the PHI. So you only give them access to the instruments without PHI. Uh, they can still be part of the project, but everybody gets different privileges and rights. So in the case of this person, um, I know they are not having an account because their name is not in parentheses. So I am going to go ahead and remove them as a user. Just so we see. Um, and um, you can see that if I look here, all the different privileges um, that I could potentially have. And again, I can make, I can give myself these privileges as well or take them away. And also I can assign roles. So I could have a data entry role and then I could have people added to the data entry role. So when you have this set up with user rights, you will see the list of all the people on the project and all the roles they have. And that's gonna be right over here under user rights. So that's one place it's gonna be or project setup as you're walking through, it's telling you who's gonna be on that project and what rights do they need. So now we're clicking that off uh, right there. So now we come to the part of testing the project. Um, and remember I said at least three records. Um, I said at least, uh, I, if you have a really complicated project, you're gonna have to do way more than three, but um, just to make it um, the minimal of three. So if I'm testing this project and it's not a survey, I would either go to add edit records here and I would add a new record, or I would go to my record status dashboard and add a new record. There's multiple ways to go about to do this. Um, and you might notice that this says 100, this is 101, 103, 104, you know, where's, where's 102? Somehow it didn't get added there. I don't know, um, I'm not sure what I did, or maybe I deleted it by accident. Um, so let's say I wanna go ahead and add 102. So right now um, I have auto numbering set up for my records. So I would not be able to add 102. They would want to go and add probably 105 or something. So let me see what comes up if I go ahead and add a record. So yeah, it wants to give me 105. Well, I don't want 105. I wanna add 102. So I'm gonna go back to my project setup and I'm gonna disable that auto numbering because I'm the one gonna be putting the numbers in. And then I'm gonna go to add edit records and as you can see, I don't have the option to just add it. I'm gonna put 102 in there. And then I'm gonna test that out. So first thing is to go into my enrollment. Remember the gray icon uh, means nothing has been done. Nothing's completed. So I open it up and this is pure data entry. What's my favorite color? Remember I had that one. There's my today date. And this is with a validation. This would be a file upload. So maybe I would upload a biosketch or a CV or something like that. Um, the last name, uh, just put a last name in here. Um, and a phone number, including area code. Let's say I start to add a number, but I, I kind of get confused. This is a validation that only allows it to be a number with a correct area code. So again, it's a nice thing in REDCap to help you do better data entry. So it would have to have a valid area code. I'm just gonna put 317, and then I can just put a number um, of any sort. Uh, so the email, the same thing with the email should show up. Um, this has a validation for an email. And you can see why this is important uh, because let's say I put an email and I, and I just do, don't do it right. I, I kind of screw up and I'm like, okay, um, you know, and I just don't, I'm not paying attention and it, it, it will catch that. So again, it's a, it's a, it's a helper. So I'm just gonna put email at email or email at iu.edu. Okay. And the date of birth, um, so the date the subject signed consent is YMD. The date of birth is also YMD. We talked about the consistency here to keep the same. Um, if you're gonna do it a YMD or MDY, doesn't matter how you do it, just keep it consistent. And so if I put the date of birth, um, let's say I'll go back a few years and I make this person you know, have a birth date coming up, um, you can see that this calculates in REDCap, it's called a calculated field. And what it does is it creates an equation that takes the date difference between the date of birth, which is one of the variables here, 
and today's date. This is, this is absolutely one way to do it. It may not be the way you wanna do it. You may wanna use a, a date of uh, the sign the consent so the date doesn't change. Because with a date like this, every time the form is opened up, it's going to be, the person's going to be getting older. So this is one way to do it, but it may not be the way you want to do it. You could have replaced today with the date, the subject kind, the variable for the date, the subject signed consent, and that would be a date that's static that doesn't change. So this is rounded down uh, in years and the outputs in years. So this is automatically done. And in this case, it will automatically upgrade every day. The person has a birthday tomorrow, they become uh, 54, you know, so um, this is a, a, a uh, radio button field. This is a drop down field. Um, this one is what we call branching logic. So we have female male. If they're female, uh, we add have questions that can ask, you know, things that are just related to the female. Um, this is the matrix field. So this is what a matrix field would look like. Remember, different, different questions, same answers. So that's a matrix field. This is a slider field. Uh, this is a checkbox field. All right. So also we have um, rates and things. This is all in centimeters. So we're using the metric system. And we can also put parameters on it. So if by chance I put too high, there is a range that was included um, when I created this of 130 to 215. So if I put over that, you know, um, I'm going to get a red uh, option. It's too low, too high, and uh, this will help me um, again get better data entry. And this is the BMI equation, which is included in your template. Round it down with weight, um, and it's this is the metric one. So. And then I come to the bottom and I'm going to hit this. If, if I decide to do it incomplete because I have to come back, that's red. Unverified is yellow and green is complete. So I'm going to hit it complete for the purposes of this. And as you see, I'm walking through to do the testing. So I would do this with three records and I would walk through each one of these to decide, you know, how, how they're going to be set up. You can see this, you know, this is how it's going to be set up. The patient morale questionnaire, go ahead and walk through that. Um, and, and see, you know, this would all be for the testing. Okay, so questions about that. We're almost to the end of this part, so I want to make sure that we're, we've covered a little bit of that, but we're, this is where we're doing this testing, and again, three records uh, fully tested. I only did a little bit, but you'll see uh, that would be what you'd want to do. So I'm done with the testing, and then I'm ready to move my project to production. So move the project to production status so that real data may be captured. So moving it production, I can decide to keep all that data that I've already captured, but if that's just practice data, I may wanna delete all that data. Um, so these are the two options I get, and then I can move it to production uh, status. So I'm not gonna move it right yet, but let's go up and take a look at that dashboard again. And I might say, well, you know what? All this data is not good. I'm not gonna do it. But um, I want to move, I want to move this, I want to delete this data because it's just practice data. So go back, move it here, move it, actually hit this, move it to production, delete my data. And are you sure you want to delete all the data? Yes, I do. I'm going to move it to production. And now we are in production. Same thing with the project status. Uh, dashboard. And now I'm ready to collect real-time data. Go to my dashboard. You'll see no records existing. Um, I want to go ahead and make some changes, though. I realized I did something wrong. I have to enter draft mode to make those changes. And then once I enter draft mode and, and make those changes, see, I go in here. And let's say I'm like, oh, forgot one of the colors I need to add here. Um, somebody wanted to include um, blue. Uh, so I add that color there, and then um, if, if I look at this, um, it's, it, I have to submit the changes for review. So submit those changes with that new color. And this is a safeguard because any changes you make to the database design could impact your data. But at, at this point, I don't have data, so, so we're not going to be worrying about that. So. All right, so hopefully I've covered that fairly quickly. And now I'm gonna go back to, you've seen a project in um, action. Now we're gonna go back to developing and creating a project. So remember, 
when I uh, showed that PowerPoint with these options, you don't see the control center, but you saw the other ones. So I'm gonna go to new project and we're gonna call it getting started with IU REDCap 11, 11, 20, 21, just to keep a simple project title. These are um, options. Uh, I don't recommend people use practice just for fun because sometimes they never go back and change it. So operation support, research, quality improvement, or other. Um, if you use research, you, you have to answer a few more questions. If you use operation support or uh, quality improvement, it, there's no other questions. However, if you are using research, please, please do answer these questions. They help us with our metrics and they help support uh, the use of REDCap. So it's, it's important because if people, we know people are using it for research, um, you know, we can continue providing it free to everybody. So for this purposes, I'm just gonna call it a quality improvement project. And um, this is for uh, training. And remember we talked about different ways to upload projects. Um, start here with the, the template. Um, that is what I recommend to everybody that's starting out. Um, and there's a lot of different templates. Unfortunately, you can't see the template, uh, but you can get a good description of the template. So we have basic demography templates, classic database, um, field embedding, human cancer tissue. And each one of them tells you how many forms they'll have. We have a longitudinal, one arm, two arm, multiple surveys, multiple surveys, longitudinal, piping. Uh, we have these new project status dashboards. Um, those are, are really cool. Um, randomized clinical trial, RCT. Okay, so pretty much lots of these. So what I'm gonna do for today is we're gonna look at, we're not, we did look at the longitudinal before, we're gonna look at the classic now. So I'm just gonna create that project and creating a project, remember, is just the minute. So where there's the title and it drops me right into project setup where I get to go through and decide how I want to make this project work to meet the needs of my particular uh, study. So the same as you saw before, um, however, we see use surveys in this project, it's not there because we haven't enabled it. So the same questions, the only difference now is um, I don't have eight options because I haven't enabled longitudinal data capture. I've only enabled a uh, single data capture. So in this project, let's say uh, we're gonna go ahead and um, do uh, surveys. So we're gonna go ahead and enable that surveys. As you notice, it shows up over here and we're not gonna make it longitudinal. Um, so I'm gonna clean, clean, clear that out. Then we're gonna design the data instruments right here. These are um, six data instruments. And again, it's not a longitudinal because we have all the forms. We have three months forms, but their instruments are different for each form. As you can see, this one is uh, the date visit num underscore one. And this is date visit underscore two. So this is a classic database. It's not longitudinal. It exports a little differently. Um, the user rights are right there or in your project setup. So if I go in here, um, we are using a template and let's say I wanna make some changes to this template. I'm not going to upload the patient's consent form. So I'm gonna delete that field. Um, I wanna add a middle name or a middle initial. So I'm gonna put this, I'm gonna put a text field. I'm going to put middle name, make a small variable name. Um, there is no validation for this. I'm gonna leave it. I don't have a phone number, a date or integer or any of those, no validation. Um, I'm not gonna make it required and I'm not gonna make it identifiable. And I'm gonna leave it with the same uh, alignment. And um, you know, I, I'm just gonna put it as optional so they know it's optional. And so when I save it here, you'll see now it shows up here right in the middle of uh, first name and last name. Um, I can take it and move it if I want to um, by just clicking on it, moving it here. If I'm moving it to a different form, I would move it here. Um, each one of these icons does something. This one is where you open it up and make the changes. This particular icon here is what we call branching logic. Let's see if I can find an example with the branching logic. Uh, branching logic, go here. So this says sex equals zero, which means 
that this question, which has a raw data of zero for female, it would only show if somebody clicks female for that. So this is where this comes in. Um, this particular option is right here. You can pull it across. All of your questions are here and you pull it over there and that would give you, and you can do more than one. That's your branching logic. The same with this one. This particular branching logic is a double branching logic where we look at the sex is female and if they've given birth, um, a matrix field. Um, so any questions about that? Um, yeah, so where can we get the recorded session? I think uh, Robert uh, will be able to provide that um, after uh, we finish this, this session. So any questions so far about all that we've moved ourselves through? So as you can see, we've just created the project and we're doing all that work on the project. Remember, go back to project setup and walk yourself through. So if I'm done with this, um, I wanna go ahead and check that off. Uh, another thing I encourage you to go and see is the shared library. Don't know, gosh, if I have time to move over to that today. No, I'll do it anyway. So shared library is just awesome. <laughs> Um, so I click on this. Once you have a project, you can pull instruments that have already been curated, uh, already been developed into your project. So it's, it's a huge resource. It's got over 3,175 different um, instruments. Some of them are curated. Um, some of them are ones that you use as standardized instruments. All of them are free as long as you agree to the terms of use. And we have some of them in different languages. So be sure to check out the shared library, especially if you're using standardized instruments for your research project. Um, some of the ones we see commonly used is the PHQ-9, which is the depression score and the general anxiety score. And the PHQ-9, so for example, this one opens up, you would be able to import it into your project, but let's go ahead and view it. And it gives you some questions and you can just take that and pull it into your project and, and start using it immediately. Somebody's done the work of developing it for you and it's standardized and it has it's been curated. So super uh, useful resource. Um, please take the time to check that out. I think you'll find it to be uh, some way to save time money um, on, on developing these projects. So that's right here. Um, pretty much anything about projects uh, instruments, I'm sorry, instruments or surveys are going to be in this particular step, uh, which is designing data collection instruments and enabling surveys. All right, so then I would move myself through that step right there um, and, and onward. So I'm um, not going to go all the way to the bottom like we did before, because what I want to do now is move into um, making a survey into, uh, making an instrument into a survey. So if you recall, I, I did that at the level of on your project setup. I did it at the level of the project. And now I have to do it at the level of the instruments. And I only want to do it under the demographics instrument. So I'm going to enable that as a survey. And if you remember, we talked about some additional functionality. Here it is. It's uh, lots of questions for you to go through. Um, super useful and uh, very beneficial to be able to design the, 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 it to the audience that you need and um, how you want it to look. Um, we won't walk through all of these, but uh, please do um, when you are going and developing your, your instrument colors, uh, uh, you know, all, all kinds of um, interesting things to do. And they're not just interesting, they're, they're, they're important. So how are they, who's how, accessing it? time expirations, how do you want to terminate it? Do you want to use the e-consent framework? Those are all included in this wonderful survey settings area. So once I have that, you will see that I have survey settings here and now I have automated invitations. So let's walk up here back to the survey distribution tools. And there we are with our public survey link. So remember, this is anonymous and if, if we're not collecting data, which I think we are. But if I wasn't collecting, if there is no data, uh, personal data, this would be anonymous. This is my only anonymous option. Use recapture if I'm going to be um, sending this out or posting it to social media. So let's take a look at what this looks like. 
I haven't done anything to pretty it up really. So we'll just see how this looks. So this will be the survey. Here's the recaptcha. Chimneys. If I can find the chimneys here. Right, that's it. So um, we'll just walk through uh, how this might look. And actually, with this particular option, you see city, state, zip. I would never put these all together. This is a template. Um, so I would recommend uh, breaking this apart um, as much as you can. And then we're just going to throw some uh, fake data in here and see how this works through. So that would be the first survey taken right there. As you can see, that's a survey. That's a public survey link. And um, I didn't take it through Outlook, but um, as you can see, this could be sent via URL to Outlook. Um, let's say uh, we know that we're going to be putting people in there. We can do it this way where uh, we actually want to add a participant name. I'm going to put my email in here. So we will add participants. This is the step, the second way to do it. That's not anonymous, but it is confidential. I'm not going to put it in an identifier. So if I take the survey, you will know I've taken the survey, but you will not be able to link my data if there's no identifiable data uh, collected um, to this. So uh, I will compose that survey invitation, decide when I want to send it in the future or immediately, decide if I want to do reminders, compose it, uh, the survey, um, there's my email, and then send that invitation out. Uh, so uh, it's probably not going to work because the reminders got enabled and I didn't set anything. So let's say if we'll just send it out. And uh, once you see it sent out, so it'll look much different than the anonymous one. The anonymous one comes in, can't view those. Uh, this one, because it's in here, you can see that I haven't responded. The invitation's been sent or sending. There's the link. Uh, there's a QR code, so I could also have a QR code if that's an option. And uh, only one has been responded to because remember, I haven't responded to the second one yet. So any questions so far of, of what we've covered um, in REDCap? Anybody wanna, um, anybody wanna look at something in particular of all these features off to the side here that you know you might say, well, I need to do that or I need to do that. We've looked at we've looked at pretty much the high level ones, um, uh, the dashboard, uh, which is going to be here. Obviously, our dashboard is very skinny, um, but uh, we've looked at the dashboard. We've looked at user rights. Um, we have looked at um, surveys, uh, the project setup, which takes you through several of the different um, features. Uh, that you can use in REDCap to develop your project. We've looked at um, a project without surveys, a project with surveys, enabling surveys. So um, anything else that you would like to look at or cover that I haven't covered um, at this time? I mean, there's so, so many things I, I could cover, but I, but I don't want to go uh, too much in depth um, and, and make people too confused. Let me um, see, we have a, have, yeah, go ahead. Can we look at the data exports or reports and stats? Yeah, sure, absolutely. So um, data exports, reports and stats, um, that would be something that you would wanna look at after you've done some testing on your project and you've got some data. Um, so you can see how that, that exports, but we don't have a lot of data, but we'll take a look really quickly at it. So A is all the data exporting the data or stats and charts. So you'll see right here, um, I don't have a ton of data, but all that data that I've collected right there is here. Um, pretty, 
you know, some of it's blank. Uh, you can see because I haven't gone through all the all the all the fields. Um, within this, I can look at stats and charts of what's maybe going on uh, for this particular person. We only have an N of one, so uh, not a lot of not a lot of data. But um, you could kind of see uh, this person Hispanic, the race, um, different things are going on with this person, uh, the given birth. Any of them um, that have predetermined uh, can show up here. And, and we do have an option, uh, which, which will the project dashboards, which can use some of these uh, reports and show them in a project dashboard. So that's, that's a super helpful thing. Um, so let's go back to reports and see what else we have going on here. So you can make it based on selected instruments. So as you can see, there's lots of different instruments here. There's uh, six, I believe. So I could pick it out based on an instrument. Um, and then the third option is I create my own report. And this is what a lot of people do, is they create their own report. Let's say I want to know um, on this particular test report that, you know, when somebody has answered my survey or whatever. So I would go to Quick Add, and um, maybe I would look at the date, the date they've enrolled, so I've known if they've completed the survey. Then I want to know if they've completed it, and um, maybe I want to know um, if they're taking any medications and their age. Um, so not many fields, um, but I go ahead and I'm going to close that out. Um, here, I would decide who could have access, but since I'm the only one on the project, uh, that, that doesn't really work um, for this particular one. But let's say um, within this, these are filters. So sec step two is every all the fields to include. Step three are the filters on those fields. So maybe I only want to work look at the dates for people that were signed after um, January 1st of this year. So I know there were people that signed last year, but I don't really care. I'm only looking at the people moving forward. And then these are live filters, which um, won't be so relevant at the moment, but they could be, uh, for example, maybe I want to look at the different sexes and toggle back and forth between those. So let's take a look at this particular very, very small project. So um, in this one, we have the date the subject signed, which is after that date. They've completed it. And these are the things that they've typed. They're 19 years old. Um, so we can take a look at the sex, female, uh, y yes, uh, male, no. Okay, so that would be a, what, what a live filter looks like um, on this particular one. This one could be exported. Uh, you take this and you export to any of the major statistical packages ex and also Excel. They can export and de-identify it um, or, and or apply the live filters when I export. There are several different export options, export the data. If it's identifiable data, think about exporting it because you move it out of REDCap and you move it out of that secure environment. So sometimes you may want to just export a de-identified set to be on the safe side if you don't need to know the people. Um, but that's that's basically uh, reports, um, exports uh, in, in, a, in a nutshell. When we have a project that's only um, not, that's not, it doesn't have any events, it's not longitudinal, uh, the data actually shows up fairly well. When you have a project that's longitudinal, then um, you're going to see um, multiple rows for the same record. And sometimes people, that makes a little, people get confused about that. But that is just how it exports. Uh, within REDCap, we have a pretty extensive FAQ. We also offer some video tutorials. And we also have the option, if you have the idea about a feature, send it off. Let us know what you think. Send it to REDCap to suggest a new feature. We always uh, are looking for people that have fresh eyes on a project that can maybe come up with something like, it would be great if REDCap had this. And many of the features that we have now are, have been suggested by people that are users of REDCap. Um, and then within here, this is REDCap at iu.edu. This will go directly to our REDCap uh, queue and will be answered um, most likely within the same day uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll try to help you move forward or answer your questions. So did I answer the questions about the reports? Do you want to see a more extensive report? Um, do you have a, a test project yourself that we could pay, pay, perhaps take, take a look at? Any of those, um, I'd be happy to do. Uh, no, I think you answered the question. I was just asking because, um, so once it's exported, well, it'll just be the numbers, correct? Like it won't say the ones that they chose. Um, what, what, what do you mean by that? 
I guess uh, it, it won't say the numbers unless you remove the identifiable fields. It, it okay. would say the text fields too, as long as, you know, so, so, so yes, it would like, okay, let's just export, oops, sorry. Let's export this with uh, labels uh, to Excel and, uh, and I'll show you what it is. Hold up a second, cause I'll probably lose you on this share screen, but I'll pop back up. I'll pop it open here so we can take a look. Um, so um, okay. I don't know if you can see this, but like, here's the last name, here's the first name. So these will be included in this Excel and it would be outside of REDCap now um, because I didn't put it as de-identified, you know? So yeah, this mm -hmm. is what we call labels. So the labels are gonna be using things like Hispanic or American or female. Normally you wanna export raw data, which would be the numeric values. So this is what okay. a label looks like. Um, the, 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 the raw values would be like one, two or something, but, but still these text fields would be included if it's not put as de-identified. Okay, thank you. Uh-huh. Anything, any, any other questions that um, we can answer that I can help you um, kind of take a look at maybe something that's it's relevant to your, your project needs? I'm happy to, uh, to do that at this point. Oops, I'll go back to where I was before. Um, so we've taken a look at like the surveys. Uh, oh, the one thing I should show you is the code book. Okay, so let's do that. So we're in a RedCap project. Um, again, project set up here. Let's try from starting from here because I'm trying to remind people that if you're lost, go to project set. <laughs> That'll take you where you need to go. Don't go project home, go to project set. Um, so project setup and off to the side here is what we call a code book. And I really like the code book because it lets you see the project without having to go into every single instrument and, and look at the interface that way. Uh, they call it a human readable and, and, and you'll see one when I open it up. And you don't do anything with the code book. You don't have to make any changes. It's just done in real time, kind of like behind the curtain. Uh, so the data in, date enrolled is your variable name is in this column. The field label is in this column. So it's gonna look exactly like we created it. And then the field attributes. So this is where you can do those checks on consistency and numbers. So this is a date field. It's a text field um, and it's already validated with date YMD. This is a text field that has an identifier. This is a text field that has an identifier. This is a big notes field. So these are the field types and these are the attributes that go with them. Um, and this was a calculated field. So here you can see exactly the calculation, the ethnicity, um, this Hispanic or Latino is what we call the label. This is the raw data, 012. So you can choose depending on how you export that. Again, with the race, um, sex. Uh, this is a field where how many times has the patient given birth? And it's an integer field. Um, this is a checkbox field. So they may go to the gym uh, multiple times. Um, this is all under our matrix. So these are all ones that would be the matrix. So as you can see, um, they are a little different formatting, but the same uh, a answers, just different questions. And then within this, um, so that's one, we collapse all the instruments and we can see all the instruments that we have going on. You can see this one's been enabled as a survey and the rest of them are not surveys. So here's our baseline field where we're gonna be doing that baseline data and mostly collecting lab values at this point. And you can see, again, these have um, text fields, which I said to limit, but in this case, you would need a text field, but you wanna put parameters or kind of validation on it. These are, this particular is a validation and these are parameters. So if the parameter says three to five and I enter a 10, it'll just show up and say, hey, you're outside of range. I can ignore it or I can change it. So that's, that's options up to me. Um, so these are yes, no. Um, as you see, yes is uh, presence, no is absence. So this is a code book. Uh, take a look at that. You can, you can export it, you can print it out, you can share it, um, and it updates as you make changes to your RedCap project. So yeah, I've got a few more questions, a few more uh, minutes here, and I'm gonna go ahead and um, just open it up for questions. If anybody wants to see anything, 
And if, if you're if you're if you don't have any questions, um, we'll go ahead and we'll go ahead and end the training. But I want to just thank you so much for joining today. And I hope I've helped you get started with IU REDCap. And please join next week uh, for our surveys in IU REDCap. And um, and or if you would like to have an individual consult uh, with you or your team, uh, reach out to us at redcap at iu.edu and we'll we'll uh, set, set set up a schedule to do that. So thank you again. I appreciate. Um, you taking the time this afternoon to, to learn a little bit about REDCap. And I'm going to wait on the line, so if somebody has some specific questions uh, to enter by chat or mute, uh, chat can go ahead and let me know. Thank you.